Hello, and welcome. Hello, and welcome. Today, we're going to be looking at the UNET model architecture. Since 2015, this has been a go-to architecture for many machine learning tasks. But more recently, it's gained even more popularity down to its incredible performance in image generation. All of the images in the introduction were courtesy of the DALI-2 diffusion model. However, almost all of the cutting-edge generative models whether they be generative adversarial networks or any of the diffusion model variants such as Stable Diffusion, Imagine or DALI 2 will be using the UNET in one way or another. So, now you know how radical UNETs are, let's have a closer look at them. The UNET architecture was initially proposed as a solution to medical image segmentation problems, but was quickly adopted for all sorts of different tasks. It has a unique structure that makes it particularly effective for tasks with high resolution inputs and outputs. That could be tasks such as image segmentation, where we're mapping images to segmentation masks, super resolution, where we're upscaling low resolution to high resolution images, or, as I've already mentioned, diffusion models we're transforming Gaussian noise to newly generated images. Well, why not try Cascader Diffusion, where we simply strap three units in a row for even higher resolution generative creations. Units rule. As you may have noticed, all of these tasks take an image's input and produce a new image. For example, in segmentation, we are trying to learn a mapping from the pixels of an image into the pixels of a segmentation mask. If we have ground truth data, such as hand-labeled segmentation masks, then we can train a machine learning model, such as the unit, to predict these masks and hopefully generalize to new unseen images. For example, with a set of input images and hand-annotated segmentation masks, we could train a unit model. By passing in our images to our model, we can produce an initial guess at the ground truth mask. Initially, our guess won't be very good. However, we can still use it to compare against our ground truth label. This comparison gives us an error we can use to adjust our model's parameters, meaning that the next time we pass in an image, we'll have a slightly better prediction. So why is this model so effective when working with high resolution inputs and outputs? Well, the UNET model consists of an encoder followed by a decoder. The encoder is responsible for extracting features from the input image, whilst the decoder is responsible for upsampling intermediate features and producing the final output. The funky thing about units is that the encoder and the decoder are symmetrical and are connected by paths. This design gives the model its namesake, the U. The unit is known as a convolutional neural network with an encoder-decoder type architecture. This means we process images such as this man on a bike and attempt to extract useful features such as recognising these two bike wheels. Once we have a rough idea that this area probably contains a bike, we then decode these features back to their former resolution in an attempt to get a pixel-perfect representation of where the bike is in the original image. Have another look at the architecture and see if it makes a bit more sense. Let's have a closer look at the encoder, the decoder, and the connections in between them, based upon the original paper. Features are passed through an encoder consisting of repeated convolutional layers and max pooling layers that extract intermediate features. 
These extracted features are then upsampled by a corresponding decoder, where saved copies of the encoder's features are concatenated onto the decoder's features via connecting paths. The final layer produces the output. For example, this could be a segmentation mask. You can then simply calculate your loss with respect to a ground truth mask and backpropagate the gradients through the network to improve your model's predictions. Let's recover what we just learned and go over each of the model components in a little more detail. Let's check out our first protagonist. The encoder is made up of a series of repeated 3x3 convolutional layers at each of the stages. After each convolutional layer, the ReLU activation function is applied element-wise to each of the features. In between the stages, a 2x2 max pooling operation downsamples the features. This is a stride of 2 and is the equivalent to picking the largest value in a non-overlapping window rolled across the image. This of course reduces the spatial dimensions of the features, and to compensate for this, the channels are doubled after each downsampling operation. Now let's have a look at the next part of the network, the decoder. The decoder, in many ways, is the reverse of the encoder. It is also made up of a series of 3x3 convolutional layers, each of which is followed by the ReLU activation function. Instead of downsampling with max pooling, the decoder upsamples the current set of features and then applies a 2x2 convolutional layer that halves the number of channels. The upsampling operation is used to restore the spatial resolution of the features that were lost during the encoding phase. There are two types of connections between the encoder and the decoder. These are known as the bottleneck and the connecting paths. First let's look at the connecting paths. The connecting paths are simple. They simply take a copy of the features from the symmetrical part of the encoder and concatenate them onto their opposing stage in the decoder. This simply means place alongside the decoder's features, meaning subsequent convolutional layers can operate over both the decoder's and the encoder's features. The intuition here is that the decoded features might include more semantic information, such as this area is a bike, whereas the encoded features contain more spatial information, such as these are the pixels where the object is. When you combine both the decoded and the encoded features together, you can see how you can get pixel-perfect segmentation. Now let's have a look at the bottleneck the bridge between the intermediary features of the network. This is where the encoder switches into the decoder. Firstly, we downsample the features, then we pass them through the recognizable convolutional layers, before finally upsampling them again to their previous resolution. Let's run through an example. First, we pass our input image through the encoder, passing them through the 3x3 convolutional layers and ReLU functions. At each stage, we downsample them with a 2x2 max pooling layer and double the channels before passing them through the convolutional layers for this stage. This repeats all the way down to the bottleneck. At the bottleneck, we downsample, pass the features through the convolutional layers, and then upsample the features to get back to the corresponding resolution before the bottleneck. We now pass the features up the decoder, upsampling the features as we go, and at each stage, we also concatenate the features via the connecting paths. This pattern of upsampling, passing through convolutional layers, and concatenating the features repeats all the way to the final output layer. And there you have it. That's the overview of the UNET machine learning model architecture. As we've seen, the UNET architecture is pretty simple when you break it down into its components. It uses ideas similar to that of residual networks, where we only need to learn the difference between the input and output pixels. Since the connecting paths pass in copies of the input features, it makes it easier to gain pixel-perfect accuracy for tasks such as segmentation. The UNET can have impressive performance even on small datasets. By applying data augmentation techniques such as flipping, rotating, colour altering and scaling, these techniques help create new training examples from existing ones and make the model robust to visual transformations. A bike is still a bike, even if I rotate it 30 degrees or flip it. In recent work, researchers have found great success by training conditional units. For example, in the diffusion model framework, 
we can train a unit that has been conditioned on both time and conditioning text. This helps us guide a generative process to convert Gaussian noise into any image under the sun given enough training data. The unit model is a powerful tool in computer vision. Its unique architecture has been shown to be useful across a wide variety of tasks. Please let me know in the comments section down below if you have found this video useful in understanding the unit and let me know what you'd like to see in the next video. Thanks for watching and be sure to subscribe if you want to catch the next video.